Good afternoon. This is a replacement for the uh, recording I made yesterday, Friday. Um, a recording, unfortunately, uh, was lost. So what I'm doing here is to give a, a duplication of uh, the main part of yesterday's presentation. And I shall probably also um, give you a second uh, uh, presentation which covers the overview I gave you and um, some of the work on that we've started to do on Java. Um, so I'm hoping by now that most of you, if not everyone, <laughs> has actually managed to download Eclipse and installed it on your working machine, i.e. your laptop or the PC that you have at home. But in any case, um, what I'm talking about now is the Internet Protocol, uh, sometimes known as the workhorse of the Internet. It performs a lot of very useful work in communications between two stations on the Internet. So the intended learning outcomes for this afternoon is this. And it's conditional on you listening carefully and rising to some of the challenges that I'm actually presenting you with. So the, the intended outcomes, uh, the intended learning objectives, is that you will be able to understand the format and the fields of what's called a datagram. And I'll give formally define the datagram in a moment, but you can think of it at the moment as a sort of logical packet of holding data and I'm going to qualify that in a moment. Uh, you will also under need to understand the need for fragmentation and the three main fields involved in the task of fragmenting a packet or datagram. Uh, thirdly, you'll come to understand the options available in an IOP packet, an IOP datagram. And the options just means that uh, certain uh, different routing alternatives are available. And in addition, some information can be gathered about the time of arrival at a particular router on its journey to a remote destination. And I've got a note here about, uh, you'll understand the components and interactions of an IP package. Well, that, that's just a, a technical uh, termination of the, the discussion. It just shows you a little bit about the, the hardware aspects of IP. Uh, what I want you to note is um, uh, an RFC. I want you to understand what an RFC. RFC simply stands for uh, a what's called a, a request for comments. Uh, often uh, these are documents proposed by internet engineers for wider public um, uh, validation, criticism, appreciation, uh, and so on. I mean, they're, they're very much discussion documents, and very often they're, they're representing a definitive statement of the particular status of some aspects of the internet development. Um, and in general, uh, there are going to be RFCs on many aspects of uh, the internet. For example, t the TCP protocol, which we're going to have a look at in a couple of weeks' time. And the, uh, the relevant RFCs actually give you a better account than most of the textbooks, and these are free. Uh, on the other hand, that they, you know you don't get a, a book uh, with a hardcover to refer to. It's just going to be a paper document, but they are free. Okay, so I'm going to start off by uh, focusing on protocols, and I'm going to give you a fairly non-standard introduction and explanation of what protocol is. So if you think about communication, we need some mechanism in general 
that marks the beginning of a communication or communication act. Well, why? Because uh, logically, I need to know when your communication starts. And in fact, I also need to know when it ends. Well, why? Because um, <laughs> I might mistake the beginning of a, a communication and get uh, the contents of the message badly wrong. And it might be a very simple event. For example, you can imagine uh, a short whistle marking the beginning of a communication. It's introducing the fact that I'm just about to talk to you. And when that communication ends, the transmitter or sender of the communication maybe whistles two short bursts. And that tells me, well, you finished talking. All right, that's the end of the communication. So I'm talking about some way of marking out the uh, the actual communication that uh, takes place. Uh, you can think of the whistle followed by the communication, followed by the two whistles ending the communication, as a, a wrapping up or packaging of the communication content. Okay, so it's it's like um, the idea of a, a whistle introducing some data or some communication, uh, plus some other kind of uh, marking of the end of the communication. You could think of that as uh, an env a logical envelope for the communication, or a logical envelope that contains the message. Uh, something very much like this happens in real life, as we have noticed in past presentations, uh, some convention indicates that you are about to say something, and I'm talking about social communication now, and a pause in that spoken communication indicates that you have, I'm sorry, I made a mistake on the slide, uh, indicates that you've finished the communication. So beginning to talk, um, during a silent period indicates the beginning or your intention to utter what I call a speech packet. A speech packet. And in real life, it, usually it's not necessary to indicate that it is to you that I'm sending a speech packet. It's to you that I want you to listen to my whatever I say, my speech packet. And secondly, when I send you a, an ordinary letter or otherwise communicate with you, I need to logically address a physical envelope identifying the intended recipient and include my own address. In normal circumstances, I should include my own address. Yeah, I should, uh, I should include the sender's name and address. And the message communication may well be written uh, on the familiar paper found in an envelope. And the address might be purely digital or digitally expressed. For example, there's no reason why I shouldn't provide an address by means of a sequence of bits. Um, and I wish, I sometimes think, um, the post office would prefer it if you could uh, provide a, a digital address because they can just scan it in and or perhaps automatically uh, route it into the right dispatch box at the local sorting station. Uh, you can extend the range of this idea uh, to sending someone an email. Uh, it's just an addressed packet with a, a includes the sender's address. I mean, you might have to fiddle about a little bit to find out who it was that actually sent it, because the the actual sender's name might be quite different from the name that appears on the, in the sender field on an email. So in the case of a digital address, this could be uh, a transmission over a network. Uh, and I'm talking about actually the transmission of a, a whole envelope or packet of data, I could first of all provide a digital address. I can digitize the content of the letter or the message. 
and that I can also digitize the sender's address if I so wished. So if you're transmitting, you're thinking about transmitting data over the network, uh, providing it's understood that uh, that particular initial bit sequence represents the intended destination. So, um, so f if a second device detects a zero on the wire, for example, and again I've made a typographical mistake here, it's known that a message is just about to be received. It's coming in. It's just about to be transmitted. So I've got to be prepared to look at what comes after the zero. Um, and I'm going to talk about, for a few minutes, UART, which stands for a UART is a universal asynchronous receiver transmitter. It's a device that converts parallel data to serial data and transmits the data serially without any kind of regard to the receiver's clock. I'm just going to go ahead and transmit. And you might think, what, what on earth is all this about? Or maybe um, what I need to communicate with is a supercomputer uh, built on a single thin slice of silicon. Here I've got a circular, uh, a circular uh, um, shaped piece of silicon and on it I've got possibly 400 little processors and to communicate with this assuming that each of the processors has its own hardware link all designed on silicon I need to if I need to communicate with this I probably need to uh, uh, send parallel data to it but convert it to convert it serially so the data can actually be maybe use a single channel to communicate serial data to each of 400 different processes. Well if you're interested a UART looks a bit like this and um, uh, here's a system bus and I can actually uh, write data to a transmit register, a TDR, transmit data register, and that converts parallel data from the bus into, it's going to put it into this register, and I can load this register, all the bits of data, into a serial, what's called a transmit serial register. And uh, using this device, which is called a bode rate generator, um, it, it actually gives me a clock signal, which enables me to transmit uh, one, bit of, one bit contained in this register at a time, one bit at a time, out onto, out onto this serial line. And I mean, this might take you a little bit by surprise, but there's, a, there's some probability that your laptop might contain a URL for serial transmission. These days, um, you know, maybe laptops don't. It doesn't really matter, but the idea is that uh, I'm just going to focus on the transmission of serial data to another machine or to what's called a modem. Um, which might connect to an, uh, an analog device or a microwave device and can actually send, convert the, the digital data coming from this register into an, an analog signal or a wireless signal or send it down a telephone line. So they're, they're sort of quite useful. So, um, uh, if I divide one divided by the rate at which uh, data is going to be transmitted using 
the bowed clock uh, gives me the duration of uh, uh, a bit period. This is a bit period. And maybe initially the line is one, then it drops to zero, indicating that the sender's just about to transmit some data. And what comes next is possibly a one or a zero. Look, and that's bit one. That's the first bit of information. And the line changes either to a one or to a zero to, to transmit the second bit and similarly for the third bit. So um, if you're <laughs> curious about this word here, bowed, it um, comes from uh, the person who studied and was very interested in um, uh, the rates at which digital information can be transmitted. And he's Monsieur Bodo, a Frenchman. And rumour has it that he was very interested in the speed at which data could be communicated and uh, teased his mother by talking so rapidly that uh, his speech more or less sounded like a, a hiss. I mean, he was speaking at such a fast rate. In French, of course. Um, so, what um, the, the horizontal axis here represents time. Initially, at time period one, the, the wire is high logic one, five volts, whatever, however you like you to describe that, then it drops to zero, indicating the start of the communication. And what follows is the uh, presentation of the bits one zero, one zero, one zero, one zero, which in fact is the seven bit ASCII code for the letter lowercase u, which is quite interesting. And then after it's been transmitted, I forget about, I'm not going to discuss parity bits here, but it's just a, a way of actually indicating whether or not any kind of corruption has occurred in the transmission of the data before it. The line goes to one, it returns to one, meaning that no data is going to follow. I've transmitted seven bits together with a parity bit, and the line returns to one. And I've actually transmitted, and hopefully trans successfully transmitted, uh, the letter U represented in ASCII. And we, we've looked at ASCII. We were looking at ASCII when we considered, um, when we considered uh, uh, compression at the end of last term. So for newcomers, do have a look at this presentation on compression where I do introduce the idea of an ASCII, extended ASCII characters and normal ASCII characters. This is how you represent uh, uh, data. Uh, certainly, um, uh, character data, character-based data inside a computer. Okay. So, moving to hardware. Uh, and I've said already, there are devices, perhaps one on your own computer, called a USART, which is a purely synchronous uh, receiver transmitters, which enable communication to place, take place serially from your computer to an off-computer compu off devices. Uh, but they're, they're sharing a clock, okay, sharing a clock. And the question is, are they still used today? And also, by the way, you better check my <laughs> definition of a USART. Remember, we, we've just been talking about UARTs. And uh, so here we go. The working definition number one is of a network protocol. A protocol is actually a special rule governing data transmission. And this rule plays an important role in a specific form of data communication. There are lots of different protocols. For example, one protocol might be if you receive a particular digital sequence 
What's about to arrive is a TCP packet, or maybe it's an IP packet, or maybe it's a, a UDP packet. And once we've identified what kind of packet's arriving, we can deal with it. So in general terms, we're interested in the transmission of uh, data over the internet, in which case uh, a lot of them, if not most of the data, is going to be transferred using IP. And IP uh, can readily be identified. And if, uh, if it doesn't obey the particular protocol, then it's going to be rejected. I mean, you know, the receiver's not going to, really not going to understand what, what's coming in, what data form is coming in. So, simply, the network packet will be transmitted using an identifiable envelope consisting of a sequence of bits that enable the receiver to identify it as an incoming IP packet. And some other bits indicate the length of the packet and how much data is being transmitted. Another third typographical error here. There is, uh, there is not a need for anything corresponding to a stop bit. I mean, if, if I know that the transmissions started and I'm told explicitly how long the packet of data is going to be in terms of bytes, then I don't need to have to end or mark the end of a packet or envelope by a stop bit, as we had to do in the case of a UART. Um, so this accurately underpins the concept of a network packet and protocol. The transmission of such a packet and the receipt of such a packet, I'll try to give you a, a clear, informal uh, explanation. Right. So logically, a network packet involves uh, an envelope which contains data and the address of the destination and the address of the sender, plus a fair amount of other important information. And let me see, the protocol itself um, actually refers to the particular rule uh, uh, determining successful transmission and receipt of a a particular kind of packet. Um, so part of the special rule is implied by the structure of the logical data factor and the way it is transmitted and received. So the part of the rule uh, can only be understood by understanding the construction or the structure of a, a packet. And that's what we're going to look at in the case of, of IP in a few moments. Definition number two is something called the protocol stack. And if you notice, there's a, it's a set of layers. And at the top layer is an application. And it, well, it's going to be something like, uh, could be something like Zoom. And Zoom is going to depend on the, the services of the layers below. Um, for example, the transport layer uh, uh, defines TCP, uses TCP, uses UDP, and a couple of other protocols. And the network layer is where IP is to be found. So application like Zoom is going to use Possibly, and you'll have to find out about this, uh, one of the protocols found at the transport layer. And to use one of those protocols at the transport layer, you need the services of the network layer. Well, that includes IP. I mean, as we're going to see in a moment, um, if, if your application uses, say, UDP, then you're going to need to send your UDP packet P 
piggyback, riding piggyback on an IP packet. In other words, a uh, UDP packet is going to be encapsulated or, sorry about this, I've got to, uh, is going to be embedded in or encapsulated in an IP packet. And the IP packet, in order to be sent halfway across the world or all the way to Mars, uh, needs to use the services of the data link layer and the hardware layer. So, for example, wide area network or local area network technology. I mean, or you might just be using uh, fiber optics or microwave communications to give you the reach from uh, the sender all the way to the receiver. And so, sorry about this uh, going for backwards and forwards. Send away has actually got an application which wants to talk to uh, a corresponding application uh, on a different machine, let's call it receiver B, and to send the communication to receiver B you need to use the protocol stack and eventually uh, an IP packet will actually be sent across the internet and received and the receiver is actually going to strip out the data needed, etc., etc., and hand over the actual audio or video content to receiver B. And then receiver B can do corresponding act of communication, can communicate, communicate with send away. So that's a protocol stack. Right. IP is the workhorse protocol of the TCP. IP suite, so we'll, I'm going to show that uh, in the diagram in, in a moment. So, uh, so to repeat, TCP, UDP, ICMP and IGMP data or packets are going to be transmitted using IP packets or IP datagrams. The only exception uh, is that ARP packets aren't going to uh, use IP. ARP, is, uh, ARP stands for Address Resolution Packets and it's just going to, I think it's going to convert, ARP actually converts um, hardware addresses into IP addresses but we're, we're not bothered with that at the moment. All right, and packets, you'll remember I'm taking to mean exactly the same thing as a datagram. I like the word datagram. Right. So TCP stands for Transmission Control Protocol. UDP simply stands for UDA, User Datagram Protocol. ICMP is, uh, stands for the Internet Control Message Protocol. And I'll illustrate one use of ICMP in a few moments. And IGMP is the Internet Group Management Protocol, which I'm not going to say any more about. Right, so first of all, let me tell you a little bit about the general characteristic of IP. IP provides an unreliable, connectionless, datagram delivery service. And we looked at unreliability uh, last term the context of well what we were interested in was how to how to build a, a reliable protocol what do you have to do what features does a protocol have to have what rules need to be followed if you are to attempt to guarantee that the datagram or the packet you sent to the receiver arrives uh, so a definition of unreliable simply means that there's no guarantee that an IP datagram reaches its destination. But it does provide a best effort service. And in contrast to IP, TCP gives you reliability. Uh, UDP is again a non-reliable protocol, but it's very useful for transmitting speech and uh, video uh, 
on the grounds that it's very fast to uh, to get to its destination. You might lose some packets, but does that really matter if um, you know, you know you you're losing a, a few frames from your video? I mean, this is a very good case for saying that uh, a human audience won't notice that if some frames are missing. So um, if something goes wrong, uh, if a router runs out of buffer space or buffers, uh, it uses a simple error handling technique, but it's not terribly effective. And this is why I, where ICMP uh, comes into operation. So what am I talking about? If a router to which I've sent an IP datagram doesn't have enough memory to temporarily store the packet, what it's going to do is to discard the datagram and send an ICMP message back to the source saying, sorry, I've just dropped your packet. And uh, logically, uh, the ability for ICMP to be sent, a message to be sent back to the source is simply because it can look inside the IP datagram or packet and find the sender's address. Okay, well, what does running out of buffer space mean? Well, um, it's simply this. Um, networks can become very, very busy indeed. And it does actually take a fraction of a second for a router to choose a route away from the buffer for the IP packet to continue its journey to its destination. And uh, a router offers one or more queues. Uh, the problem is the queues are of finite capacity. You can only store so much, store so many packets. If there's uh, congestion, there's a probability, there's a possibility that there's not going to be any queue space for an incoming packet to be temporarily stored. In that case, the packet is going to be dropped, just forgotten about. Okay, and having said all that, well, reliability is going to be a, a main task of TCP. Uh, I said a few moments ago that IP is connectionless. And what I really mean by that is that IP packets are independent, logically independent of one another. And uh, the IP software on the sender and the receiver doesn't maintain any kind of uh, state data about successive datagrams. In other words, if I'm a receiver and I receive a datagram, I, I, I don't remember that fact. I, all I'm doing is busy preparing to receive the next datagram. And similarly, if I'm transmitting a sequence of datagrams, the sender's not going to uh, know anything about the transmission. It's going to send a, a packet, then forget about it. That The job's been done. It's sent a good packet out, and it's going to prepare, the next action is going to be simply to prepare sending the next IP packet out. So that it, it's, if you think of statelessness, it means there's no state data either on the receiver or the sender. It just simply means that uh, neither has a memory of what's just been sent or received. So uh, each datagram is being handled independently of any others. So uh, IP packets will typically arrive at the destination, given that they are going to arrive, out of order um, relative to the order in which they were sent. And the reason for that is simply that an IP packet might uh, be given a different route from the previous IP packet, or um, 
who knows, or it might be sent out on a slower route, a journey that involves uh, uh, more distant, less speed, or something along those lines. Or it might, a packet might be sent on a route which is actually suffering from congestion, whereas the next few packets are, are being sent on a, a congestion-free route. Um, so, um, this is the position of IP in the overall protocol s stack, the old overall protocol suite. These are all um, applications, um, like for example FTP is file transfer protocol, file transfer application. This is the mail application, this is the domain name server, uh, and so on and so on and so on. I mean, Zoom is going to appear somewhere here, and Zoom is going to call on the services of, or Zoom is going to be, be put here, and logically it's going to use the services of the next layer down, possibly. Uh, might use UDP, and UDP, in order to transmit UDP, you need the services of IP, and IP then needs to be sent out over the internet. The uh, services offered, like the send operation involved on a fiber optic cable, or an ethernet, or uh, something or other. Um, so a packet in the IP, whoops, we have, we go, uh, a packet in the IP layer as we've already found out, it's called a datagram. And a datagram is a variable length packet consisting of two parts. Firstly, the header, secondly, the data part. And the header is going to be between 20 and 60 bytes in length and contains information essential to routing and delivery. So I'm just going to uh, pause this video at this point.